This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Unspeakable Joy TV. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I'm going to preach to you for just a little bit on why is God breaking my box. Verse number 1 of Mark chapter number 14. And man, wasn't that choir a blessing? Lord have mercy. That was a blessing. Scott and Dwayne, y'all did good too. (laughs) Nobody ever says anything to y'all. Y'all did great too. Let's just look here at verse number 1 of Mark chapter 14. The word of the living God says, After two days was the feast of the Passover. And of unleavened bread and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. Now, beloved, in verse number 1 and 2, you have what the world is trying to do to Jesus. But while the world is trying to destroy Jesus in verse 1 and 2, I want you to watch what one woman is doing in verse 3. And Being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she break the box. Say that with me. And she break the box and poured it on his head. While the world was trying to kill him, she was trying to figure out a way to love him more. And while the world and the people around you don't understand and they're living like they're living, don't worry about the people around you. You focus on how you can walk and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is God breaking your box? Father, it is in the mighty blood-stained, redeeming name of Christ my Savior. And Lord, I know that you've put this in my heart and I know what my assignment is today. And so, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. And Lord, help me to do what you've called me to do. Strengthen your people. Encourage your people. Save some soul today. In Jesus' name, amen. You be seated this morning. Thank you again for standing. As you come into Mark chapter number 14, you are just days away from the death of the Lamb of God. You're just a few moments away from them taking him out of the Garden of Gethsemane and putting him in a pit in the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. In just a few hours, he'll be dead. In just a few hours, all hope is going to seem gone. But before that that happens, there is a dinner that takes place. A lot of people believe it takes place on either Tuesday or Wednesday of the Passion Week. And at that dinner in the the city of Bethany in the house of a man whose name was Simon the former leper, there is a woman that comes out of the shadows and she comes and in a moment's notice she takes what the Bible calls an alabaster box. She takes that alabaster box and contained inside of that alabaster box is what they call spike. And I have a picture of it that I want to show you what an alabaster box, it's not really a box, it's more of a vase. It's more of a jar, and inside of that jar, that jar would have contained what was called spikenard. Spikenard was a precious ointment that was used in several different occasions and events. And the Bible says that she takes that, that, that box and that spikenard on the inside, and she pours it out on the feet of Jesus. Now, this story is told in three different passages. It's told by Matthew... It's told by Mark, and it's told by John. Every one of those writers that tell that story give us a different detail that the others do not give. It was Matthew that says when she poured it, she didn't start at his feet. She started at his head. John tells us that when she got there, everybody around her said, you've wasted this money. But the only detail that Mark gives us that's unique about it is how she got the ointment out. 
The Bible says, Mark alone makes this statement. Says that in order to get out that oil, she breaks that box. She shatters that vase. Now, in order to understand what I'm talking about this morning, you got to understand the picture of that vase. That vase, that alabaster box, it can represent three different things in your Bible. Number one, it is a representation of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that is poured out upon humanity. You see, He is that precious thing that was poured out for the atonement of our sins. He is that wonderful thing that was shattered, but by His shattering, the entire house is filled with the aroma of His glory. You see, that's what makes this place wonderful. Not the preacher, not the singing, not the pews, and not the Baptist. It is the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ we have one source, we have one goal, we have one idea, we have one message, one melody, one thought, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. But I don't want to preach on that this morning. The second picture that you can say about that alabaster box, it can represent that special thing, that important thing in your life that you give to God. Everybody's got one thing that they cling to. Don't y'all look at me like that. I know I ain't talking to myself. Everybody's got that thing that they're good at. They've got that thing that matters to them. That thing that if you used it in the wrong way would do nothing but bring glory to the devil. But when it's broken and given to Jesus, it fills the house with an aroma. But I don't want to talk about that this morning. There's a third picture of that alabaster box. Simply... It's a picture of our life. That alabaster box is a picture of you, and it's a picture of me. And man, I wish I could tell you this morning that the God of heaven let that woman take that box, that picture of our life, and put it on the glorious top shelf. But that ain't what he did with that box. I wish I could tell you this morning, God let that woman take that box and shine it in the... But that ain't what God did with that box. You know what God did with that box? The Bible says, and she break the box. That word break in the he or in the Greek, it's got three pictures, and they're interesting pictures. Let me see if this feels like what you're feeling right now. Number one, that word break in your Bible, it literally means to shatter and crush completely. Not one aspect of that box was left untouched. I mean, there wasn't a big chunk that was... I'm talking when she shattered it, and I've been thinking about that for three days. How did she go about breaking that box? I believe with every fiber of my being, she took that vase up in her hand, and she slams it down because the Bible says that she wiped his feet with her hair. You know what she did with that hair? She used it like a mop to mop that oil off the floor. Number two... That word break in your New Testament, it also means to shatter one's strength. You see, when that box got broke, it could not do anything else. When that box got shattered, it had no ability to stand up by itself. Then the third picture of that box, when you say break, it has a third picture, and it means to bruise, have a sensitive spot. To have a place that when it gets touched is mighty tender. Let me ask you a question. If I said that that alabaster box is a picture of your life, child of God, would that not represent where some of you are feeling right now? You say, God, I feel like every time I try to get up, you break me back down. God, I feel like you have crushed me completely. I feel like there's not an area of my psyche, not an area of my life, not an area of my walk with you, not an area of my existence that you have not crushed completely. And God, you have crushed me so much that you have taken all of my strength. God, I wake up wanting to do something for you, but oh God, I feel like I've got no strength to do it. God, I go to church with good intentions, but I sit in my house and all I can think about is how little I feel and how bad that breaking is. But number three, God, I feel bruised. And any time anybody ever just touches that spot, I don't know what your kids are like, but my kids are demons. <laughs> At the house, Dwayne, I'll, I'll have my shorts on or I'll have my t-shirt on and, 
And man, the other day, I took them bowling. I took my kids bowling. I was preaching revival. I had nothing to do that afternoon. So I took my kids bowling. I don't do stuff for a reason. I took, and you people that bowl for fun, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Scott, I took that blessed bowling ball, and I don't bowl a whole lot. So I figured really the only way to knock the pins down is to throw it hard. <laughs> so I took that bowling ball, that 14-pound lug nut I had on the end of my three fingers, and man, I, I reared that ball back, and I'm in my three-piece suit up here preaching. I didn't even take any, any lounge clothes. And if I'm lying, I'm dying. If I'm lying about it, I'm sitting there. And I take that ball and I roll it back. And honey, I mean with every fiber of my being, I launch that ball. Before that ball hit that floor, it hit the side of my kneecap. <laughs> honey, I hit the dirt. I dropped the ball. It went off in another man's, another man's gutter. It, I hit the dirt. I said, I'm done. I'm through. Erica said, we paid $30. I said, I don't care if I had to sell my liver. I'm not playing anymore. <laughs> and fellas, you know what we all do when we, when we, when we hurt ourselves for the rest of the day. <laughs> I couldn't even get any sympathy from Austin. And I have got this ginormous bruise on the side of my leg. I'm talking a knot. It could be a tumor. I don't have any idea. I, I may have a blood tumor right up under my kneecap and die right here on this platform. And my blessed cuss son comes up to me yesterday. Erica said, I just need you to watch him for three hours. What could go wrong? I'm sitting there reading my Bible, just engrossed in the things of God. And I feel that low life son of mine come up and stick his finger right in the side of that bruise. If I hadn't have been, if I hadn't have been lame, I'd have killed him. Now, we'll laugh about that and we'll joke about that, but some of you have got that sensitive spot in your life right now. And it feels like every time you expose yourself just a little bit to the things of God, to the truth of God, trying to get close to God, the devil comes and sticks his finger right in the fact that marriage didn't work out and that thing didn't work out and that home didn't work out and that job didn't work out and your mind's not working out. Every time, and you'll say, God, why are you breaking my box? Why is God breaking that box? There's so many broken people around. And that's an amazing thing about Christians, people that are really walking with God, true believers. If you've come to Christ, you didn't come whole. You had to come broken. Most people don't come to Christ that are fixed. They come to Christ in order to get fixed. And they think the moment that they kneel on an altar somewhere that their life is going to be fine and there's not going to be any more upkeep and there's not going to be any more fixing. Honey, you are going to be like that construction going down 85, going to Charlotte every time you drive past it there's going to be construction going on in your soul you are a work in progress and if I was working on you I'd be building you but do you know how God builds his people by breaking their box why is God breaking your box? I'll give you three reasons. Number one, the first reason in the passage that God lets this box be broken is to humble you in order to understand anything about that box, you've got to understand where that alabaster box is made. That alabaster box is made in a city called Alabastron, Egypt. It was formed down in the mines in Egypt. And the way that they would form those vases, those boxes, is they would dig out in the dirt and in the soil there in Egypt. And they would take that marble-like structure. Miss Kim, will you put that, put that thing back up to that picture? They would take that marble-like structure and they would call it a alba, or they would call it an alabaster box because of where it was from. And everywhere it goes, it would represent the fact that it was a, a jewel of Egypt. Here's the problem with the Bible in Egypt. Everything from Egypt in your Bible is a picture of the world. 
Everything you see come from Egypt is a picture of this world. And God can't use anything from the world. It's too rotten. It's too vile. It's too wretched. It's too sinful. And he's too holy. And he's too wonderful. And this is what God says. He says before what's inside of that vessel from Egypt can touch the holy feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's got to be broken in a thousand pieces. So you don't pay attention to the box. You pay attention to what's inside of that box. Ladies and gentlemen, when you and I come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are that hardened vessel. We've been hardened by sin. We've been hardened by pride. We've been hardened by ability. We've been hardened by all these things. That's why we march into church and we like going to churches that make us feel good about what we are and make us feel good about where we stand and make us feel good about what's going on in our lives. Here's the problem with churches that make you feel good. It's like air conditioning a vehicle that's on its way to meet a brick wall. You are not helping them avert the danger that is before them. Right now, if you are alive, you were born in this world, you are under the curse of sin. You are under the curse of depravity. You were born into Adam's race. And in order to get close to Jesus, you've got to humble yourself and repent of your sin. That's what we, that's, that is why so many people will not trust in Jesus Christ because they just can't get over themselves. I don't have a lot of problems. I didn't ask, did you have a lot of problems? I said, are you a sinner? I have not done that many bad things. I didn't ask if you've done many bad things. I asked, are you a sinner? I've never really stolen. I didn't ask if you've ever really stolen. I asked, are you a sinner? And too many times we try to make ourselves feel good by comparing. Here's what I'm telling you about that alabaster box. It had to be humbled. It had to be broken. And this morning I report to you wonderful, glad, glorious news that no man has ever gone to the Lord Jesus Christ and bowed at his feet and said, Lord, have mercy on me for I am a sinner. Let's ask that lame man that couldn't walk, but Jesus came to where he was when he hugged the feet of the loving Lamb of God and said, have mercy on me thou son of David Jesus said arise my son get up and walk let's ask that man that was blind down at the pool of Siloam as the Lord Jesus Christ spit in the dirt and wiped that spittle on his eyes and he said what do you see now big boy he said man I see men walking around as trees all over the place he did it one more time and he said oh God once I was blind but now I see let's ask that lady that was taken in the very act of a adultery. If Jesus can fix your life, she looks around. They're ready to stone her life. They're ready to tear her up, but she has mercy and she finds grace at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. He does one action. He writes in the sand. He looks at her and he says, woman, where are thine accusers? She said, they've all left, Lord. He says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. When you humble yourself before God and repent of your sin, God can use you finally because you're born again. Now that's a side note. I don't want to talk about the sinners that are hard as rocks. I want to talk about us Christians that have got that streak of pride in us. I know you got problems. And I know you got problems. And I know all y'all in that section right there got problems. And I know this section over here's got issues. Now I want y'all to look at me and say, you got problems too. One, two, three. I don't like that. (laughs) Isn't it amazing? We can point out every problem that everybody else has got. And we don't understand why God ain't breaking their box. But every time I try to get up on my high horse... I feel the long arms of love and omnipotence take my life and crack me over the floor again. What's God doing to you? He's trying to humble you. There's something in your life that needs fixing. There's something in that life of yours. Man, I'm telling you right now, this just makes me cringe on the inside. You mean me, the preacher? I got problems. My name's on the sign. I can't have problems. I got that Johnny Carson smile going on on that sign. It can't be me got the problems. Guess what? Until I realize I'm just a hard vessel. 
It's got to be broken. What does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. That's this kind of attitude that old TCG enjoys having. They are the problem. Man, if they would just do right, I could do right. I can't believe they didn't talk to me. I can't believe they didn't ask me to preach. I can't believe they didn't ask me. Me, me, me. And therein lies the problem. How do you know if you got pride? I found about the easiest way to figure it out. When somebody criticizes you, is your first response to get mad at them or is your first response to say, God, teach me. Teach me. Now, I didn't say everybody that tells you you're sorry is right. But when you're humble before God and you've been broken, here's what you'll say, God, is there anything I can learn even from them? You know our problem in this place right here and all these people watching? You know what our issue is? We're hard and we don't want nobody to know it. Hard choir members, hard preachers, hard deacons, hard watchmen, hard ushers, hard video, hard sound, hard musicians. We're all just a bunch of hardened vessels. And every now and again, God will take that box of your life and He'll say, now I'm doing this because I love you. Pow! And He'll let it all fall apart. Now here's what's amazing to me. Even when the vessel... Now y'all got to use your imagination. They act like they've done checked out. I'll talk to y'all. Even when the vessel was shattered... Imagine being in that room. Even when that vessel got shattered, there was not one broken piece that wasn't still at his feet. You see, we got this idea that when we're broken, we're not near God. We got this idea that when I got problems that get pointed out by the Holy Ghost, God, you must be mad at me. He says, no, you're just as much in my presence when you're broken as you are when you're whole. You're just as much in my presence when your life is shattered and when you got that sensitive spot as you are when nothing seems to be going. God will break you to humble you. God ain't trying to humble me. Well, you're probably the very one he's trying to humble. I ain't got no problems. They're the problem. You probably are the biggest problem you have. He'll break you to humble you. Number two, he won't just break you to humble you, but he'll break you to dedicate you. He'll break you in order to dedicate you. Now, I want to show you something on that vase, vase, whatever the correct term is. That box, that alabaster jar. You see, those those boxes, those jars, they were given to women when they were young girls. Whenever they would have what they would call their bat mitzvah, they would give them the jar. When a boy would have his bar mitzvah, they would give him a prayer shawl and a copy of the Torah. But whenever a woman would turn 12 and she would reach the age of accountability in the Jewish culture, they would give to her an alabaster box. And inside of that alabaster box was that spikenard oil. And that spikenard oil, it was symbolic. She was to keep that jar and was to use it on her wedding night for a perfume. And in order for that that vase to stay purified, the top of that vase would stay sealed. And she would break the seal on that wedding night. And that's how the people knew that she was still pure. When that woman, though, would break that seal, she wouldn't break the jar. You know why? Because she wanted to reuse that jar. She wanted to have the ability to resell that jar. Now, when Mary of Bethany took that jar and shattered it in a thousand pieces, you know what she was saying? This jar has one purpose. And it's to anoint the feet 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, I read commentator after commentator, and they all said, she broke the seal. That ain't what the Bible says. The Bible says she break the box. Son, she took that thing like a jar of Duke's mayonnaise that would not open. She raised that bad boy up above her head and at the feet of the Lamb of God, at the feet of the Lord of glory, at the feet of the rose of Sharon, at the feet of the lily of the valley, at the feet of the bright in the morning star, she said, this jar is never going to belong to anybody else. This jar is never going to be reused for anybody else. I got one goal and one one purpose and one idea and that's to anoint his feet. Honey, she raised that thing up over her head in the sight of all those people. Can you imagine the heart attack that went through that room when they said, no, you can't do that. What will everybody think if you give it all to him? No, you can't do that if you lay it all down at his feet. No, you can't do that. What's everybody going to think? She said, I don't care. This jar's got one goal and she shattered that jar. Ladies and gentlemen, the church of Jesus Christ is in a bad need of a revival of I don't give a rip. Do you know what that revival says? Though none go with me, still I will follow. The world behind me, the cross before me, nobody going with me. I am still going to walk with Jesus Christ. Here's what God's doing in your life. He's trying to take away all those people that have got their hands on your life. Man, when that jar was whole, everybody wanted a piece of that jar. When that jar was whole, everybody was thinking, man, I hope she re-gifts that to me. I hope she refills that for me. I hope she does something for that because I got a job for that jar. I'm going to sell that thing. I'm going to take that money. And man, when she broke that jar, everybody took their hands off of it except the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop. Time out. When you ain't got no problems, everybody likes you. I'll talk to y'all. When you ain't got no issues, everybody wants to put their hands on you. When you got it together, everybody wants you. When you can sing a song and make a buck, everybody. When you go to record a CD, everybody. Oh, you're going to write a big story. No. Yes, eh? when you can sell a lot of insurance and when you can cut a lot of hair and when your life isn't falling apart, everybody's reaching for your life, wanting their hands all over you. But isn't it amazing when the doctor says, you can't work like you used to? Isn't it amazing when people start saying, I didn't know you had all those problems. I deal with people all, all the time. They'll be married. And man, they came a walking down the aisle singing do wa diddy diddy dum diddy do. <laughs> and it's a year later. And you know what they're saying now? I didn't know you were that broken. And now they're taking their hands off at you. Who in this room right now feels like everybody in this world has tossed you to the curb? Nobody wants to touch me. Nobody wants to have anything to do with me. Nobody wants anything to do with my life. Honey, there is one. There is still one seated at the table. There is still one when she broke that jar that started saying something like this. Y'all think she's just messed up. What you don't realize is she's just done something that's going to be testified as long as the gospel is preached. They're going to talk about how she has anointed my body for the burial. What you think is this. You think I'm broke and nobody wants me. Here's what God's trying to show somebody. You're broke and I'm still the only one that wants you. But can I help you with something? Nobody wanted the jar even when they were touching it. You know what they wanted? They wanted what the jar could do for them. But when that jar got busted... That jar saw very quickly, there's one that all he cares about is what's inside of me. 
God, I wish that jar could talk. You know what it'd say? When everybody walked away, that's when he stooped down. Who's the man or woman in the house? And when they've all walked out on you right now, there's still a hand caressing your spiritual soul. And you say, who is that? It's the hand of omnipotence. It's the hand of mercy. It's the hand of grace. It's the hand of power. It's the hand of God. Can I give you the third reason why that box had to be broken, why God's just shattering your life in a thousand pieces? This is a very deep point. It's going to be so deep that I'll be written up about as being a shallow preacher. But this is how deep it is. You ready? You ready? Here it is. Number three. The reason God broke our box, get the good stuff. To get the good stuff. Aaron, where was the good stuff in that box? It wasn't that alabaster box. You know whatever they found out whenever that box got broke? That it looked like marble, but it wasn't really marble. But what was important and valuable about that box was what was on the inside of that box. Inside, Miss Kim, put that back up. The, the, what was inside of that was this, was this oil called spikenard. Now, what is that oil a picture of? If I'm the box and you're the box as a child of God and we're the box and God's breaking us to get out what's on the inside, then what's on the inside that makes us valuable? Well, I looked up that phrase spikenard. And that spike nard has got four characteristics. Let me give them to you right quickly. And let's just play a little clue game. I like game shows. Let's, let's play a little, little mystery trivia. Because what that oil represents that made that box valuable on the inside is what's on the inside of me and makes me valuable. Number one, that spike nard came from the Indian Himalayan mountains. The Indian Himalayan mountains are some of the highest mountains in the world. So number one, that spike nard, that precious thing, it came from on high. Number two, that spike nard oil, it was the outflow of what happened when you cut the stem of a sweet flower. There was this flower in India and they would cut the stem of that flower and what came out of that flower was called spike nard. So number two, not did it just come from on high, but number two, it's the outflow of a broken flower. Number three, it cost a year's wage. You had to give up your life, your salary, for one year in order to buy that thing. So number one, it came from on high. Number two, it was the outflow of a broken flower. And number three, it cost somebody their life in order to give it. And number four, what you find out about that spike nard is once it would get on you, you couldn't get it off. It was sticky, Jamie. If it got on your hand, you could try to wash it off, but you couldn't get the substance off. And everywhere you went, they would call you a sweet-smelling saver. Everywhere you went, if it touched your feet, it got on your feet. If it touched your hands, it got on your hands. Now, here is the point. You know what that oil is a picture of? It's a picture of the Holy Ghost of God. You see, it came from up on high, and it was the outflow of the riven side of the Lord Jesus Christ from which flow the water and the blood. It was because Jesus gave his life that I can have the Spirit of God. And when I got saved by the grace of God, I got baptized by the Holy Ghost of God and now everywhere I go I try to shake it off but there's something on the inside and I try to wag it off but there's something on the inside and everywhere a child of God goes they look and say you look different. There's something different about your life. Oh God, oh God, oh God I just thought about something Christopher. Jesus is dying. 
He's on the cross. And they take that gall, that vodka Roman mixture that was a painkiller, and they shove it in the mouth, but he rejects it. Can you imagine how it flow all over his body? Can you imagine the smell of dirt mixed with blood caked on his body? Can you imagine what he should have smelt like? It was so bad that on that Sunday morning after the crucifixion, the Bible says that Mary and the other Mary come to the tomb to anoint his body with spices. But they never got to. You know why? Because when they got there, he was already up. Now, fast forward. I'm going somewhere. Fast forward. Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, has never been touched except by one human hand, and that was Thomas. He was never anointed, but yet the New Testament calls him a sweet Smelling savor. If nobody's touched him since that day at Bethany, but he's still called a sweet smelling savor, do you know what that means? What was on him was more powerful than what happened to him. What he got put in him and on him was far more powerful than what the enemy tried to do to him. I know it feels like in your life that the enemy is breaking you and shattering you and he's marring you and he's scarring you and he's destroying you and he's tearing your nerves up and he's ripping you to pieces and you're saying, oh God, I smell in the eyes of the world. I smell in the nostrils. They see that divorce. They see that pain. They see that addiction. They see that problem. They see all that brokenness. But yet, what you don't realize is what God put in you is more powerful than what the devil is doing to you. Can I prove it? Watch this. Remember what I told you at the very beginning of this whole thing? The only person that tells us that the box got broken was who? Look at the top. Mark. What do we know about Mark? Here's what we know about Mark. We know that Mark got called to preach, got so on fire for God, he got lined up with the Apostle Paul. But in the book of Acts, Mark got homesick. Mark got sick and wanted to go back to mama's cooking and mama's uh, laundry. Can you imagine the shame that he felt when he walked back. Fast forward to the end of the life of the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 11. Paul is about to die at the hands of an executioner that Nero's going to send down to his Roman prison. It's going to be all over. And the story's going to be done. Can you imagine the unresolved tension inside of John Mark? God, I let him down and now he's about to die. I failed him and he's about to die. But before Paul gets done writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 11, this is what he says. Only Luke is with me. But take Mark and bring him with me. Why? He is profitable to me. For the ministry. I thought Mark was a failure. Mark was a failure. But he learned what happened when God breaks your box. There are people in this church right now that are shattered. And you don't understand why it happened. You don't understand why you did it. Why that happened to you. Why this situation. And you don't understand what God has allowed 
to shatter your life. What you don't understand is God's trying to get out of you the good stuff, which is all God and none of you. I'm, I'm done. I done helped myself this morning. I done helped myself this morning. If I didn't help nobody else, man, I helped me. Listen to me, beloved. You can walk around all day long like so many of us do. And all we want to do is when a broken piece falls off of our vessel, we want to glue it back on. And what you don't understand is when you don't embrace your brokenness, you're keeping the good stuff from flowing out. Thank you for watching this broadcast of Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. Our prayer is that you have been challenged and changed by the power of God's Word. Unspeakable Joy is only able to broadcast on this station through the regular prayers and financial support of people just like you. We thank you for your faithful support. For more information, visit us online. To request the full sermon from this broadcast, call us at 833-FULL-JOY or write us at Unspeakable Joy, P.O. Box 4558, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27404. All of our sermons and other resources are available online. Be assured that God's Word has the answer for your every need that you may rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory.